like to introduce uh, two books to start off with. The first is Darwin's God. And because I'm going to quote from this, this is the book. And then the second one is uh, when you deal with the theory of evolution, you have to read this book. Anyone recognize this book? It is Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. Very few Christians have ever read this, and yet they talk a lot about evolution. No, you should read, and then you are informed. The third book is entitled The Reality of the Christian Faith, a short logical treatise based on science and philosophy, and I am the author of the book. It is available on Amazon. Uh, it'll go for a donation, and I'm giving this as a donation, so when you give a donation for this book, it will pay for our expenses here. Let's get to the topic for this morning. Yesterday, we spoke about science and Christian monotheism, and we said that the public had actually disconnected them. But what we did yesterday was show that they were not disconnected, they are together. Science and Christianity actually go together. Science means knowledge. And so true knowledge will always go with the source of true knowledge. Therefore, we saw yesterday that they are together. Today it's the opposite. The public says that these two things are together. Science and the theory of evolution. They go together. So we're going to examine that. Many people are convinced that the theory of evolution is solidly based on scientific evidence and should be accepted by all. In fact, they say any who disbelieve the theory should be considered scientifically ignorant. But what would result if we honestly and carefully examined and questioned this claim? So our session is focused on the question, is evolution on scientific, based on scientific evidence and facts which can be examined and tested? That's the question. So let's see for ourselves. So I'm going to quote the first statement from this book which I just showed you, Darwin's God. Very few people really put Darwin and God together. But this theory, this book states it, and I believe we're going to start with that. The statement is, in fact, this is the last statement in the book. For a fruitful public debate, we need to understand evolution's foundation. We need to understand this because ultimately evolution is not about scientific details. Ultimately, evolution is about God. So that statement says two things. Number one, it says evolution is really about God. And number two, evolution is not about scientific details. So is that true? Well, let's look at that. Is, science, is, is evolution really talking about God? Evolution and God, that's the first point. It is probably the most influential idea ever generated by science. What is the it? The theory of evolution. From public policy to pulpit and in most things in between, one can find influences from evolution. But despite its influence, evolution is not well understood. Here's one point, not well understood. The key evidence that swayed Darwin was not direct evidence for evolution, but evidence against creation. There is no such thing as evidence for evolution. That's what we're going to look at just now. And I've quoted from the book, I quote it again. Evolution is not built on scientific data that support it, but on the assumption that God could not have created. Remember, it's an assumption. God could not have created the world in this particular way. And if God did not do it in this particular way, when then he never did it at all. That is the argument. So, if he didn't do it at all, well then what happened? Oh, well, we have a theory, the theory of evolution. Can you see what's happening? God couldn't have done it. Therefore, he didn't. 
And if he didn't, then creation didn't take place. And therefore, we do have another theory. It's the theory of evolution. So we are not having any evidence for theory of evolution. We are only wondering whether God really did it or not. So it's an idea about God. So the inference is that. So based on that, we make the idea that theory of evolution is valid. This argument is a negation of creation rather than a positive scientific affirmation of evolution. So here are some examples of the negation. Note the words God. I've underlined them. Statement one. Evolution is supported by the premise that God must make species absolutely fixed. Beaks must not get longer, color must not change. And since beaks do get longer, like we found in the Darwin's finches of the Galapagos Islands, and color does change, like in the peppered moths of Birmingham and Manchester in the UK, we know that God must not have made. Right? We're talking about God. Number two. Because there are millions of insect species alone, this requires God to perform many millions of miracles. I can't believe that. And I can't believe that, so it didn't happen. Number three. Would God create five species, one after another, to mimic a continuous trend of evolutionary change? And since I can't answer that, well, it never happened. Number four, the sequential appearance cannot be reconciled with creation. And since I cannot reconcile it with creation, we'll toss it out and we have another theory. Number five, what could have possessed the creator to bestow two horns on the African rhinoceros and only one on the Indian rhinoceros? And because I cannot answer that, well, there was no creator and never happened. Can you see the assumptions are the basis of your final conclusion? Such speculations are religious. Did you notice that? God, everything in God, recreation couldn't have happened. Such speculations are religious, not specific, for they hinge on one's personal concept of God. Evolution by natural means is a fact for the evolutionists simply because creation is impossible. But this whole argument for evolution depends on one's view of God and his creation. Thus, the first point has to be established. Creation, evolution does rest on a religious idea, the religious idea that God could not have done it. Therefore, we have another theory. But is there any evidence for this theory? That is not even in the picture. No, this theory of God's creation it can't have happened. It could not have happened. Therefore, we say that evolution happened. That's the first part of that statement that we read right in the beginning. The second part is the quote from Cornelius Hunter claims that the theory of evolution is not based on scientific information and details. So the second part of Cornelius Hunter's statement says that evolution is not based on scientific information and details. That's the focus right now. We will employ four approaches to look at that question. Number one, genealogy and heredity. Number two, natural selection. Number three, the time frame required. And number four, has evolution been actually scientifically proven? That's what we're going to look at. First, genealogy. You know what genealogy means? <clears throat> the father, parent, gave rise to the daughter and son. And the daughter and son became parents, and then they gave rise to, and so they came down as a descending genealogical order, means ancestry. One gave rise to the next one. And then they diversified according to the theory, and that's why we have so many different groups of uh, biological organisms. But they're all connected by genealogy, heredity. Remember that. So we're going to look at that first. Genealogy and heredity. Two ways we're going to look at it. There are about 250,000 fossil species in all the museums of the world. If you collect them all together, it's about 250,000 species. But not one chain connects of intermediates connects any two of them. Suppose I say, and I've, I'm a descendant of Alexander the Great. How many of you will really <laughs> believe me? Hey, I'm so bitty, and he was a big warrior. And if I say I'm a descendant of Alexander the Great, what will you ask? 
You will say, how are you connected? Is there a genealogical line between Alexander the Great and you for you to say that? And if I tell you, no, there is none in between him and me, but he is my ancestor. And this is only 2,500 years. What if it's a million years? And you cannot provide even one in between. How can you say that it is connected? Number two statement is a statement by Theodosius Dobzhansky, who makes a very bold statement. We're going to look at two, both of these. The first one, the question of the 240,000, 50,000 species. It's effectively impossible, says Henry G., who is a science reporter for the very prestigious journal Nature in the UK. He says this, it's effectively impossible to link fossils into chains of cause and effect in any valid way. Each fossil represents an isolated point with no knowable connection to any other given fossil and all float around in an overwhelming sea of gaps. Fact, I've just told you the fact. We have 250,000 species of fossils in the world. Not a single chain of intermediate organisms connects any two species. Have you heard the word missing link? Yeah, everyone here the missing link. What does that picture show? That there's a chain and one of those links is missing. Isn't that the picture? Missing link. Hey, wait a minute. The whole chain is missing. It's not just the link. So when they use the word missing link, it's a real misnomer. It is not that the link is missing. The whole chain is missing. So don't get carried away and say, oh, let's work about this and talk about this missing link. No, don't talk about the missing link. Please show me a chain. Only then can you say this became that. Without the chain, you can't. Genealogy has not been then established. We're given 250,000 opportunities. Now I'm going to make a very crude, crude example. Suppose we're playing ball. How many strikes and you're out? Three strikes. What would you think of a batter who's staying there after 250,000 strikes and he still wants to bat? <laughs> right? He, look, you got 250,000 chances to prove that one organism became another and you cannot cho choose even one of them and establish one of them? Did you get that picture? Yes. We do have. And so now the statement by Dobzhansky. He says this, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It sounds profound and it sounds professorial and it sounds very impressive, but when you look at that, we do not need evolution in order to study biology at all. No one needs to know if organism A became organism B in order to study A or B. Biology is the study of A and the study of B. And when you study A and B, you can look at the features and you can classify them. You don't have to say one word of how A became B. Are you with me? Evolution is taught, not talking about the features. Evolution is talking about how A became B. And therefore, we, we, we will, when you look at it, the biological features remain the same whether A became B or B became A. Are you with me? Yes. Because the features are in the organism. You can study the features. You don't have to say A became B in order to study the features. You can go straight to the features. And so evolution is not the study of the features. Evolution is the study of the process of change, which is history, which is not science. And it is so bad history that nobody will teach it as history. If you try to teach it as history, they'll throw it out. One million years between A and B and you can't show one connection? No. Number two, the natural selection. The word selection um, means two things. At the end, the result will be that you have less in your hand than what you started off, right? Suppose there's a box 
or a bag or a basket of 10 apples and I say, please select. How many will you have in your hand? All 10? No, it'll be less. Selection finally results with less. If you take all 10, it's not selection, it's taking. And if I say don't take, then it's grabbing. Selection results in less, never more. So we have this organism with so many units of genes, genetic material, and if we select, you'll have less, never more. But you need more because this organism is becoming bigger and greater, and the bigger and greater needs a genetic base to it, so the base must become bigger. And if you can't show that it's become bigger, then you can't have your theory. And since it cannot select, number two of that statement in natural selection is that if you are selecting, then whatever you have in your hands came from that basket and from nowhere else. So here are two parents. And the child will get its features only from the parents, right? Not from anyone else. So here's a species, so you can have variations of the species, but you cannot have another species because you need to have genetic material from another species for this child to become that species, and you just can't. So what we are saying is, once you use the word natural selection, you have permanently blocked the whole idea of evolution. Because evolution requires you to become bigger, stronger, Fitter. How is it going to do that if it does not have increased amounts of genetic material? And if you cannot add, you cannot have evolution. Evolution is not just selection. Evolution is selection and retention and addition. Only if you add can you have evolution. Now the evolutionary scientists did recognize that. So in 1980, they had an international conference of evolutionary scientists. And before I say the word, I'll, I'll, they use some words, I'll tell you what they are. Have, have you heard of microevolution and macroevolution? Microevolution is when you have just variations within the species. Macroevolution is when you shift from one species to another and from the genus and on, all right? So here's what happened at the conference. The central question of the Chicago conference was whether the mechanics underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomena of macroevolution. And this is Roger Lewin, the science reporter for that, for that conference. He said the answer can be given as a clear no. You, and this is from the evolutionary scientists themselves. You cannot add. There is no mechanism to add, number one, and there is no source. Where are you get, going to get the extra genetic material from? So you, two ways you've blocked it completely. In microevolution, like we said, genes from within the gene pool form different variations, whereas macroevolution, the new genes must be added. And this claim has no evidence at all. The time frame required. You know, we uh, Christians, looking at the Bible, we say the earth is about 6,000, let's say 10,000 years old, 6,000, 7,000. The evolutionary scientists will say, no, 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 it's billions of years. So I'm going to step over from a creationist to an evolutionist and say, all right, billions of years, fine. I'm going to ask whether the billions of years is sufficient for your theory. The bat swing, number one is made up of four types of unique membrane. G.G. G. Simpson, who is an evolutionary scientist, he calculated how much time it would take to evolve just the bat's wing. And the result is it would take more time than the age of the whole Earth. And according to their own theory, the Earth is 4.53 billion years. But 4.53 billion is not what you have. You have only 0.53. That's when complex organisms came onto the scene on Earth. So you have only 0.53 years. And we need the bat swing. It takes 4.53 years to develop. 
I mentioned this book, that's number two. Darwin, I don't want to open it, there's no time. Page 102 and 103 is a diagram. In the diagram are lines. Each line between one line and another, it represents about 100 million generations. And that sounds a little big, but it's in the book. Page 109. So if any of you want, the book is here. Lines, each space between a line and the next is 100 million generations. And 10 lines makes just a variation, not even another species. So 1 billion generations, next species. In the same book on page 62, he says, the elephant generates at age 30 years. So how many years do we need for an elephant just to become a variation of the elephant? Still an elephant, 30 billion years. How much time do we have? According to the scientists, only 13.2 billion years on Earth. On, in the universe, not even on Earth. So, number two, the diagram shows that's insufficient time. Number three, galaxies have been detected 12 billion light years away. That's about 1,368 trillion kilometers. So it had to get there, right? Our own galaxy is moving through space at about 600 kilometers per second, which works out to be about 19 billion kilometers in one year. Do you know we, one year ago, we were 19 billion kilometers away from where we are today. We are traveling through space, the whole of our galaxy. We left that place 19 billion kilometers away one year ago. And we are through, going through. But even at 10 times that speed, it would take 7,000 billion years for that galaxy to have reached there. And we have only 13.72 as the universe's age. There isn't time for evolution to have produced what we observe in the universe. Evolution utterly fails to explain natural history in terms of time. It does not have enough time, given all the billions of years. The theory then is fundamentally flawed. Number four, has it been scientifically proven? Here's a statement. Uh, this is from this book, The Introduction. This is the 2004 uh, reprinting of Origin of Species, and the introduction was written by George Levine. He is the professor of literature at Rutgers University right here. Very well-known guy, and look at what he says. Nobody knew better than Darwin what he had failed to prove. Talk to the evolutionary people out there. These are the words that are written in this book, page 19 of the introduction. Number two, but what does Darwin say? <laughs> does he agree with George Levine? Yes, he does. Said second statement out there, when we descend to the details, we cannot prove that a single species has changed. Nor can we prove that the supposed changes are beneficial, which is the groundwork of the theory. By the way, where is species in the classification? It's at the bottom. Species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. Hey, you are at the bottom. If you cannot run, get onto the first rung of the ladder, you are not on the ladder. Evolution is unproven, unprovable. But we believe it. However, because the only alternative is an act of creation by a God, and that is simply unthinkable. Therefore, I don't believe it. It's not thinkable. This is a statement based on religion and a personal belief system, not on science. Here's another statement. Similarly, spontaneous generation was disproved 100 years ago. And this was written in 1954, so 150 years ago. That leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds. Do you remember what we said yesterday, that science, the word science also has a philosophy? This is the philosophy. What's a philosophy? Never appeal to supernatural causation. So on philosophical grounds, no, it cannot happen. Therefore, we choose to believe the impossible that life arose uh, spontaneously by chance. Look, if you're a scientist, that statement must never come out of your mouth. 
that he will choose to believe the impossible. You know it is impossible, then you should discard it, not choose it. Fifth statement, the theory makes a prediction. We've tested it and the prediction has been falsified precisely. The, the writer is actually Colin Patterson, who is the principal officer of the British Museum of Natural History. So he's from the, from, from the line of the evolutionary scientists and he said this. Evolution not only conveys no knowledge, but seems somehow to convey anti-knowledge, which is harmful to systematics. What is systematics? Biological classification. So the theory of evolution harms biological classification. Uh, when you look at that statement, you know, the first time I read it, I said, okay, so, so what is the prediction? And how was it falsified? Only then you can state it boldly. Remember, I go out to you know, universities and that's where I speak. So if I have to say this sentence, I have to answer that question. What is the prediction and how was it falsified? Here it is. Now, the prediction is stated in a very convoluted manner. So don't bother. I'll read it and I'll tell you what it says. If evolution is descent with modification, a hierarchical array of organisms defined by nested sets of evolutionary novelty must result this is evolution's grand prediction. Now that's quite a mouthful. So let me tell you what it is really. The prediction really is that if these organisms came down by genealogy, parent, child, parent, child, then when they come down to the end and become this group, these groups will stay the same in the groups no matter what type of test you employ. Are you with me? That's what he's saying. So, organisms will remain in their classified groups no matter what type of study is done for the classification. Here's the actual data. Morphology, morphology is uh, you know, features, external and internal features. Chromosomes, enzyme genes, regulating genes. If you take any of these and do them, well, this group which has 10 and this group which has 10 by genealogy when you do, say, DNA, whoa, three of these guys get out of this group and come here, three of them come here, and four of them go to another group. Your classification is banged up. Look at the underlying statement, different stages in life cycles. You know, I, was, uh, I grew up in Pune, India, and we lived in a beautiful campus where there was a bunch of monarch butterflies, beautiful butterflies. Butterflies have four stages. The monarch butterfly, for example, has four stages. The egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. So what this statement is saying, if you studied the egg, then the monarch butterfly would be in this classification. If you studied the caterpillar, which is the larval stage, well, then the same monarch butterfly goes to that classification. And if you studied the, uh, the pupil stage, then the same monarch butterfly goes to that calculation, uh, classification. And if you studied the adult, it goes to yet another classification. Hey, what is happening? How can you classify? And therefore we say classification by evolution has been turned upside down. Its prediction that they will stay in the same group no matter what test you do has been falsified. The theory of evolution disrupts proper biological classification. So these four, genealogy, which we just saw, has not been established. Natural selection cannot produce evolution. It actually blocks evolution. The time frame required is too great by orders of magnitude. What's the meaning of orders of magnitude? Not small, huge, big difference, too big for evolution to have even occurred. Number four, evolution is not proved. Darwin himself confessed it, and its grand prediction has been falsified by scientific data. Conclusion. Evolution has not been proved. On the other hand, it has been disproved. Its basic argument is religious. They don't like you to say that, but that's true. You're making a religious argument and its scientific status is unsubstantiated. So based on scientific knowledge available today, evolution does not stand the test of a scientific theory. 
evolution ultimately had intended to dismiss the claim that God created the universe. Therefore, if you yourself have been shown to be unscientific, then that claim of God's creation still stands as a viable theory today. So Christians, you have a full scientific liberty to go to Genesis 1 and 2 and regard them as an eyewitness account of what happened. The Sabbath, seventh day of the creation, was the culminating act of God's creation. It is not an act of doing, but an act of rest. The Sabbath is a sign of rest to the human race on three counts. Number one, God creates. There's an anecdotal story about a conversation between a top scientist and God. God said, can you create? He said, of course I can. All right, then well, I'll make a man out of the dirt. Uh, can you equal that? Oh, well, that's easy. So God kneels down on the earth and makes a man, and it's beautiful and perfect. Can you do that? Oh, of course I can. He takes a camera and takes a picture from umpteen angles, puts them all into a supercomputer, and out comes the beautiful 3D diagram of God, what God had made. And not only a 3D diagram, the exact detail of how you can make it. I got to do it, said the scientist. So he picks up his shovel and goes to dig the dirt. And God says, wait, 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 wait. You want to equal me, then please get your own dirt. <laughs> what are we saying? Humans cannot create. You rest in God's creation. That is why Exodus 20 says, remember, remember, for, because in six days, you didn't create, he created. Number two, God redeems. Look, we can't create, we have no ability to create, but we have a big ability to mess up what is created. Yeah. So we mess it up and God says, oh, wait a minute, you need help. Because if you are not recreated, then you are stuck. In fact, you are actually damned. So, God will not only create, he has to redeem. The word redemption and redeem today in our language, usually we use it in religious talk, right? Most of the time we say redemption means, of course, Jesus and cross and all. But in those days, many ancient days, Redemption and redeem was not a religious word at all. It was a word that you used on ordinary days when something specific happened. And that is when you lost your mortgage on your land. You cannot pay it anymore. The only hope for you to survive then is to have somebody who will buy the land back for you. And the one who does that was called the redeemer. He would redeem the land. Now, the redeemer required three qualities. Number one, he should be able. He should have enough bank balance. Otherwise, how are you going to buy the land? Number two, you should be willing. Nobody can coerce a person to buy the land. You should be able and you should be willing. Watch the third one. You can redeem only if you are a blood relative. What is that? I'll say in other words, you all know about it, but that is it. Christmas. Christmas is when the almighty God, whose one word can create billions of galaxies, stepped down from his throne and came here to be born as a human being to become a blood relative of the human race forever. What an authentic redeemer. Only Christianity has that redeemer. So he creates and he also redeems. None of us can redeem. We are the people who lost our land. He has to redeem, and he is able, he is willing, and he is our blood brother. 
Number four, three, God sanctifies. Not only does he create, not only does he redeem, he sanctifies. He says, work out your own salvation, right? With fear and trembling. Why? Because it is God who works in you to do two things. To make you willing. You know, God never asks humans to do anything for him unless you are willing. Don't push yourself, grit your teeth and do it. Ah, wait a minute. That means you are going against your own, you know, enjoyment. God does not want that. So if you are not willing, what should be your prayer? Your prayer should be, please make me willing. I'm not going to do it unless I'm willing, God, because I know how you did it. You came down willingly. Therefore, I will do it willingly. And when I do not have willingness, I will not do it. I will ask God to give me a willing heart. Then I will do it. Willingness is the fundamental quality of a Christian, my friends. And God says, I will give you a willing heart. God works in you to will as well as to do. Humans find rest in the acts of God. That's where we find rest and, and they reach their earthly destiny, peace of mind. You know, God redeems. After creating, we messed it up. On a Friday, God said, it is finished both on the sixth day of creation and a few thousand years later hanging on the cross. It is finished. Redemption has been bought for the human race. And then he says, I'll sanctify you too. I'll give you the ticket to heaven. And on your way there, can I please work with you? Do I clean you up? You're so dirty you can't get inside there. But you got the ticket in your hand. I'm not going to take away the ticket. I'm going to clean you up. That's the way we rest in God. We rest in his creation. We rest in his redemption. And we rest in his sanctification. That is the meaning of Sabbath rest. Peace of mind. Humans find rest in the acts of God. And find their earthly destiny which is peace of mind. Our earthly destiny is not getting things. It's coming to the place where you have peace of mind with your God. So, you will keep him, says Isaiah, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, for in the Lord is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26. So the Bible takes the creation story as a fact, not as a theory. And provide the ultimate gift to humans. That all that God offers. Creation, redemption and sanctification. The whole of salvation which results, which results in eternal peace with God. That is the rest that God is calling us to. And he uses the word Sabbath. So may I wish you happy Sabbath. <laughs>